You know that music, don't you? It's iconic, the title theme from The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. It's also the whistle music from the original Legend of Zelda. And yet, it's more than that. It's familiar, but new. The melody is played more than once, and the second time, it is slightly different. The arrangement is fuller, more lush, with piano and ocarina. It's ultimately more realized, with segments which are entirely different from what came before. It is, to my mind, a good metaphor for Ocarina of Time itself. This is a game that is at once a true amalgamation of all Zelda games which came before it, while still being something completely new, and not seen in the series before. This unique blend would result in it becoming the best-selling Zelda game at the time of its release, and a beloved classic which some have deemed the best video game ever made. Its influence can't be denied, but it is occasionally overstated. This season of Legendary Adventures Podcast is all about The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Each episode will explore a dungeon and my gameplay leading up to that dungeon. Then we'll take a look at the game world and the legacy of Ocarina of Time. My name is Paul Riley. I'm a Zelda fan exploring the evolution of the Zelda series by playing through each mainline game in release order. That means I'm not including spin-offs or multiplayer releases. So let's begin Season 5 and our journey through Ocarina of Time. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time was released on November 21, 1998. It was the first game in the series to appear on the Nintendo 64, and the first game in the series to be made in full 3D. Its origins, however, predate the Nintendo 64. We actually have to take a second to travel back in time to 1987 and the second game in the series, Zelda II The Adventure of Link. Zelda II was the focus of the second season of this podcast. You'll recall the game was largely a departure from the original game. It's presented primarily in a side-scrolling style rather than from an overhead view. It also had a big emphasis on sword combat. Zelda II started with Zelda creator Shigeru Miyamoto's desire to create a sword fighting game. The decision to turn it into a Legend of Zelda game did not come until after the initial prototypes were made. Zelda II was a hit, but Miyamoto himself wasn't entirely satisfied with it. Years later, he would express some disappointment in Zelda II. In 1991, the third game in the series, A Link to the Past, pivoted back to the style of the original game while carrying over some ideas from Zelda II. In a 1992 interview about the release of A Link to the Past, Miyamoto was asked if he had any ideas for the future of Zelda. He responded, As for the next Zelda, if we go in order, it will probably be Super Nintendo Adventure of Link. As we discussed in the fourth season of this podcast, the fourth game in the series ended up being Link's Awakening. The project was started without approval by a small after-school club led by co-creator Takashi Tezuka, likely explaining why it didn't directly follow the style of Zelda II. It would appear, however, that Miyamoto was not done with Zelda 2. Zelda team member Yoshiaki Koizumi revealed in an Iwata Asks interview that he was, at one point, making Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link in polygons with Miyamoto. He said the project was intended for the Super Nintendo. He described a thin, polygon Link seen from the side and fighting with a sword. But, he said, we couldn't really bring Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link into form at that time, but I kept the desire to achieve a sword-fighting Zelda game. Miyamoto would bring Koizumi into the team that made Super Mario 64. It's me, Mario! Koizumi said he rejoined the Zelda team after finishing Super Mario 64. The timeline of all this is not entirely clear. Miyamoto said that there was an overlap between the two games. He told Nintendo Power in 1996, I was also developing Zelda 64 while I was working on Super Mario 64, and I had a lot of ideas for Zelda. Since Mario was going to be released earlier, I used some of those ideas in it. I did the same thing when the Super Famicom versions of Zelda and Mario were being developed. I switched ideas between the two games. In an interview translated on Smupulations.com, Miyamoto said the development of Ocarina of Time took three whole years. That would place the start of the project sometime in 1995. Super Mario 64 was released in 1996, 
and as mentioned, Ocarina of Time would release in 1998. Yoshiaki Koizumi also talked about the parallel development between Super Mario 64 and Ocarina of Time. He said, As we were making Super Mario 64, we were thinking about The Legend of Zelda the whole time. I would write down memos of what I wanted to achieve with The Legend of Zelda. Then, when I started making The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, I whipped out those memos and consulted them. Miyamoto is credited as producer and supervisor on the game. Zelda co-creator Takashi Tezuka is also listed as a supervisor. The game has five listed directors. They are script director Toru Osawa, who stated that he was also sort of a general director on the project. Yoshiaki Koizumi was the 3D system director and character designer. Toshio Iwawaki was the program director. Yoichi Yamada and Eiji Onuma are the game system's directors. Onuma is credited as Eiji Onozuka in the game. According to Wikipedia, this is his birth name. A Reddit thread claims he changed his surname after getting married. It's worth taking some time to talk about Onuma. This was his first time working on a Zelda game. From there, he quickly rose to become the head of the Zelda team and series producer, a role that he maintains to this day. According to Wikipedia, Onuma joined Nintendo in the late 80s after graduating from college. He had never played a video game before. Talking about how he came to join the Zelda team, Onuma said, I spent a lot of time developing games with external companies, but I really wanted to develop inside Nintendo. I pestered Miyamoto-san about it, and he said, We don't have enough people for The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, so come on in for a spell. Of the five directors, Onuma said he was the last to join the team. Development on the game began on the 64DD. If you don't know, that was a peripheral for the system that played games off of large, floppy disks. According to an article published in Core magazine entitled The Lost Peripheral by Walt Wyman and Dennis Day, the 64DD was supposed to launch in 1997. It faced multiple delays and didn't actually hit the market in Japan until December of 1999. The 64DD was a flop, and plans to release it in North America were cancelled by mid-2000. IGN noted Nintendo reps avoided talking about it in an industry show in August of that year. Wikipedia, citing the 64 Dream, says its discontinuation was announced in October of 2000. In November 1997, Miyamoto told Nintendo Power Ocarina of Time would no longer be a 64DD game. He said, We released the game as a cartridge first. We made that decision because the playability of this game is more important than incorporating a writable feature at this time. In an Awada Asks interview, the developer said the game just didn't work on 64DD. It all came down to the amount of time it took to retrieve data from the disk. Koizumi claimed he couldn't even move Link when the game was running on the 64DD. Koizumi said, in the end we decided to release it on a ROM cartridge rather than the Nintendo 64DD. I think some people were disappointed, but some were happy, none more than myself, he said with a laugh. Among the people who may have been disappointed with the move away from the 64DD is Shigeru Miyamoto. In May of 1998, IGN reported work on the Zelda game, or at least a version of Ocarina of Time, on 64DD was still underway. Miyamoto told IGN, For the 64DD, we are working on a Zelda game, which we will call Ura Zelda, where you first play the initial disc version of Zelda. After finishing everything, you could enter into the world, into the basic design of the same. This sort of Wa Zelda is now in the works for 64DD. Ultimately, the Ura Zelda project would morph into Ocarina of Time Master Quest and led to the creation of Ocarina of Time's follow-up, Majora's Mask. The Master Quest offered the same game with Remix Dungeons. It was never released on Nintendo 64 and did not appear until it was released as a bonus for the GameCube. The Master Quest was also included in the 3DS version of Ocarina of Time. We'll talk more about Ura Zelda and its connection to Majora's Mask next season. Miyamoto and the Zelda team describe a freewheeling development process. In an interview translated on Shmupulations, Miyamoto said, From the start I tried to act like a producer. Do whatever you want as long as it's interesting. My work was less about adding my own ideas as it was bringing together and consolidating what everyone else had done. Because a game this large is the combined work of a huge number of people, it's not my place to come in and try to exert my own control over everything. He told IGN in 1998, I'm the producer of this game, so I cannot say 100% of the game is made by me. I am responsible for the direction of the game, but more than 50% of the game is created by the game's many artists. 
Koizumi described his work on a Super Nintendo version of Zelda 2 as influencing his design choices. He said, I kept the desire to achieve a sword fighting Zelda game until I joined this team. It appears Miyamoto also had Zelda 2 in mind as they were designing the game, but he re-envisioned the concept for the more robust 3D capabilities of the Nintendo 64. Miyamoto suggested they make the game primarily in first person. Koizumi said, I talked with Miyamoto-san about how we would make The Legend of Zelda on the Nintendo 64 system, and he asked, how about making it so Link will not show up? He wanted to make a first-person game. In the beginning, he had an image where you were at first walking around in first person, and when an enemy appeared, the screen would switch. Link would appear, and the battle would unfold from a side perspective. It seems Miyamoto's concept of playing the game at least in part in first person was an attempt to design around the limitations of the Nintendo 64, but Koizumi said he rejected the idea. From my experience making Super Mario 64, I knew that displaying a character constantly running around on a broad field would be incredibly difficult. But while it wasn't very nice of me towards Miyamoto-san, I didn't try a first person scene even once. Koizumi said his rejection of the first person point of view was a little selfish. I was making the model of Link, so I couldn't stand to see my Link not appear. Toshio Iwawaki noted that the first person point of view wasn't actually rejected entirely. In the finished game, aiming with projectile weapons such as the slingshot or bow does happen in a first person view. While Miyamoto's initial first person idea didn't happen, Koizumi said he still very much wanted to keep the initial concept of Zelda 2 alive. In describing the desired swordplay, Koizumi referred to Chanbara. I've learned that's a term for Japanese samurai action films. At the same time, Koizumi acknowledged that pulling off combat that felt good in 3D was a challenge. In an Iwata Asked interview, he discussed how difficult it is to get the axes to line up properly. It was a problem the team needed to solve if combat was going to be a central part of the game. It needed to feel good. With samurai action films as an inspiration, it makes sense what happened next. Script director Toru Osawa suggested they take a trip to Toei Kyoto Studio Park. The film studio theme park featured live samurai and ninja shows. Osawa and Koizumi say watching one of these shows gave them the idea they needed to solve their combat problems. The show would lead to the team creating the Z-targeting system. This is not as often as erroneously stated the first targeting system of its kind in a game. Earlier targeting systems can be found in games like Tomb Raider, released in 1996. In that game, when the player draws Lara Croft's guns, she will automatically target enemies. And once the player starts firing, the target becomes locked. The camera also lightly follows enemies in that game. Consider also Mega Man Legends, a game released in 1997, which has a targeting system even closer to Z-targeting. With the press of a button, Mega Man will lock onto a nearby enemy. There isn't much to indicate that lock-on beyond a sound effect and a slight shift to the camera. Mega Man is also planted in one place while targeting. Z-targeting did not invent the concept, but in my opinion it did pull it off better than any other game at the time. Osawa recalls a moment in the ninja show which truly inspired the targeting system. He said, A number of ninja were surrounding the main samurai and one lashed out with a sickle and chain. The lead samurai caught it with his left arm and the chain stretched tight, and the ninja moved in a circle around him. This would inspire Osawa to create a targeting system, which made it so that the camera focused on the enemy while the players never lost sight of the enemy or Link. This simple concept was a major improvement over other targeting system attempts. For Koizumi, the bigger issue was how to fight multiple enemies while keeping the player from being swarmed and taking unfair hits. The Ninja Show gave Koizumi the idea he needed to solve that problem. He said, They regularly put on shows in which the hero defeats ruffians. Watching that, I thought, hmm, that's weird. That was because there was no way one person could fight and win when surrounded by 20 opponents. I thought there must be some kind of trick, so I watched very closely, and it was simple. It's a sword battle, so there's a script with a certain setup. The enemies don't all attack at once. First, one attacks while the others wait. Then when the first guy goes down, the next one steps in, and so on. For Koizumi, that was the inspiration he needed to make the targeting system a trigger for players to enter one-on-one -on -one battles, even when dealing with multiple opponents. He said, Z-targeting flags one particular opponent, telling the other enemies to wait. And the moment you beat that one, you can switch the Z-targeting to the next opponent. The game has players fighting one-on-one -on -one over and over again. Players will also find as they face enemies in Ocarina of Time, the enemies have defenses which must be bypassed to deal damage. Many enemies have armor or shields which they use to protect their weak spots. Players must wait for an opening to strike. In this way, the Zelda team re-envisioned the sword combat from Zelda 2 in a 3D space.
Koizumi said, well, prototyping Z-targeting, they wanted to make it easy to see which enemy you're targeting. So they made a marker, an upside down triangle. But I was a designer, so I didn't want to use such a simple marker. I wanted to make something else, so I came up with a fairy. After all, it was the Legend of Zelda. I called it the Fairy Navigation System, took it to Osawa-san, and asked, how's this? He immediately said, let's name it Navi, because she navigates. In an interview on Glitterberry's game translations, Miyamoto stated his initial concept of the game was small in scale. He said, at the beginning, there was only Hyrule Castle. You couldn't move around much, and I was thinking about making a game without a lot of space. Miyamoto stated it would have been similar to Super Mario 64 and Princess Peach's castle. Things reportedly changed when Miyamoto threw the team a curveball. Aonuma said, it began with Miyamoto saying, I want to put in a horse. Originally, Miyamoto had thought to create a Zelda game on a smaller scale, but what a thing to say. In an Iwata asked interview, Miyamoto said Koizumi created a horse, and they created a grassland for Link to ride the horse on. He said for a time the grassland was removed, but later the team launched a huge campaign to regain the grassland. The directors say they did not have a clearly defined goal for creating the game. Aonuma said, We were making something unprecedented, so we couldn't see what would be right to make or where the goal should be. Koizumi stated there was no set plan for the items and tools included in the game. He said, We made each one because we thought, It would be nice to have something like this. I'd say, The hookshot is done, so feel free to use it, and everyone would be like, Well, where shall we put it? Koizumi said the process wasn't always smooth. If you just make whatever you want as you go, you're sure to run into trouble sometime. But Onuma suggested that it wasn't necessarily a bad thing to tackle the game in the way he did. He said, if you decide the items you're going to put in from the start, it doesn't necessarily mean everything will go well. I don't think such a variety of distinctive items would have come about in that way. Development, however, was not smooth sailing. In multiple interviews, developers describe having elements crumbling then being rethought and remade. Sometimes it was by a decision of the directors. Other times it was Miyamoto, who is famously known for overturning the tea table. The introduction of Link's horse seems to be one of those early curveballs. A later one was the introduction of young Link. At first, the game featured only adult Link. Kuizumi also designed Link to have a much different appearance than he had in the previous four games in the series. Koizumi stated his wife inspired the new design. She asked him why Nintendo didn't have any handsome characters. In response, Koizumi cut Link's sideburns, gave him a stronger nose, and pierced his ears. However, he said he had Link wear long underwear under his tunic to keep him from being too cool. Miyamoto wasn't entirely sold on the new design. Partway through development, he asked for a young Link in the game. In an Iwata Asks interview, when asked why he was so persistent on young Link, Miyamoto said, I never wanted to make him just another cool hero. Until The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, Link was a playful and childish character. The request for Young Link resulted in the team creating the time-traveling concept that became central to the game. Toru Osawa said, We thought about how we could have both the child and adult forms appear in the same game and came up with the device of going seven years in the future by drawing the Master Sword, and then returning back to his child form when he returns it to the pedestal. It was just one reworking of the story. Osawa said the story was constantly being written and rewritten. He said, we got into it every day. I would write a script and everyone would point out problems saying, this is weird and that's impossible. Then I'd come up with a revised script. In the end, the team decided on a prequel to A Link to the Past. In a 1998 interview, translated on Glitterberry's game translations, character designer Satoru Takazawa said, the story in Ocarina of Time isn't actually original. It deals with the Sage's imprisoning war from the Super Famicom's A Link to the Past. Koji Kondo again returned to compose the music for the game. He had previously worked on the original Legend of Zelda and A Link to the Past. He said, In all, he ended up writing about 70 to 80 songs for Ocarina of Time. The soundtrack for the game would go on to become one of the most popular in the series. This popularity has resulted in some tracks being attributed to Ocarina of Time when they actually appeared in other games first. For example, Zelda's theme is broadly referred to as Zelda's lullaby by fans because of its extensive use in Ocarina of Time. It's not uncommon to hear people to state that it originates from Ocarina of Time itself. In fact, it first appeared in A Link to the Past. The same could be said for Ganon's themes. However, Ocarina of Time also introduces a number of original themes which have become iconic. These include the Lost Woods, and the Song of Storms. Ocarina of Time is also notable for making the titular instrument fully playable. 
Miyamoto said the first thing we did was make the ocarina more usable as an actual instrument with the ability to play real notes. We thought about how to incorporate that into the game in an interesting way. The ocarina is primarily used for casting a variety of magic spells. According to Miyamoto, playing an instrument is a much more enjoyable way of accomplishing things than just casting a spell. In the final game, there are 13 songs Link can play. Conversely, there are three magic spells activated through using an item. They are Din's Fire, Furore's Win, and Nehru's Love. Miyamoto said, There was a version where you could use five or six magic spells, but they didn't leave much of an impression on me, and I decided those effects would be better served as items or as ocarina songs. Of the 13 ocarina songs in the game, 12 were composed by Koji Kondo. The 13th, the Scarecrow song, is created by the player in the game. Kondo noted the challenges of composing songs for ocarina. He said, I had only five notes to use for the ocarina tunes, be they upbeat or major or minor songs making composing difficult. Ocarina of Time uses an adaptive soundtrack. That's where the soundtrack and the music dynamically shifts based on where the player is or what they are doing. This wasn't a new concept. Wikipedia lists Frogger as the first video game to use adaptive music. The Zelda series has also used adaptive music to shift the music between locations. But for me, personally, the adaptive soundtrack of Ocarina of Time stood out as being a cut above of any other video game that I'd played at that time. The smooth shifts between the field or dungeon music to the battle music, for instance. The way the Lost Woods would dynamically change in volume as players made their way to find Soraya and other elements just blew me away. Kondo himself pointed out the adaptive soundtrack in an interview published on Glitterberry's Game Translations. He said, In dungeons, when an enemy draws near, the music will steadily grow louder. If you come to a standstill on Hyrule Field, the music will have slow phrasing. Should an enemy appear, the music will change to percussion. As wonderful as the music is, and as influential as Ocarina of Time became, the developers weren't always sure they could pull it all together. Aonuma described the process as a mess right up to the end. Many elements of the game were in constant flux. Software developer Takumi Takago stated that he developed software for in-engine cutscenes to allow the team to easily make changes. Koizumi stated that Miyamoto in particular wanted to be able to change them up through the day before completion. Aonuma described some of the difficulties they ran into designing in 3D when things were constantly changing. He said the part that worried us most was making the walls out of polygons. Link was capable of a variety of actions. He ran with great force, flew using the hookshot, and caused explosions. But the violence of his movements was causing him to clip through the walls. We were making the game to match the basic abilities we had decided on Link from the beginning, but his ability settings were changed midway through. This led to the mappers, who had been making the maps according to the original settings, suddenly finding themselves having to change their maps. They were often complaining, we didn't hear about this. He also described having to totally rework the water temple because of the constant changes. He said, The amount of time Link could stay underwater changed partway through, so we were working all the way up to this summer to fix situations where you had an item become awkwardly positioned, or what have you. In May of 1998, IGN was among the media outlets which attended a gameplay demonstration. Even at that time, Miyamoto told reporters, We have all these different parts of the game, but we have never combined everything together. Once everything was combined together, IGN noted it was packed into what was at the time of release the largest cartridge ever for a Nintendo 64 game. Excitement for the release was high. Wikipedia citing Business Wire claims that more than 500,000 pre-orders were placed. This was reportedly more than triple the number of pre-orders of any previous game. In 2001, the Guinness Book of World Records recognized Ocarina of Time as having the most advanced orders for a game. Guinness's record states that 325,000 pre-orders were made in the U.S. alone. After releasing in November of 1998, Ocarina of Time would be met with widespread critical acclaim. In February of 1999, Computer and Video Games Magazine reported Ocarina of Time sold 1 million copies its first week of release. IGN reports it would go on to sell 7.6 million copies on the Nintendo 64, which made Ocarina of Time the best-selling Zelda game at that point in time. In summing up his experience with Ocarina of Time, Onuma said, Something I always think as I work on the series now is how hard it was to make The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, but it was also a great time. As mentioned earlier, we were making something unprecedented.
In past seasons, I've talked about how games like the original Legend of Zelda and A Link to the Past allowed the dungeons to be completed in a variety of orders, but I stuck to the orders outlined by the developers. This season, we're gonna mix it up. The first three dungeons do have a set order, but after that, we won't be following the suggested order. You can find the full schedule on my social media feeds. Just search Legendary Adventures Podcast on Facebook or Instagram. Links are also included in the show notes. Next week, we'll take our first steps in the Kokiri Forest and inside the Great Deku Tree. If you'd like to follow along, please subscribe. Please also consider sharing this episode with a friend. For those of you who have already subscribed, thank you. I hope you continue to enjoy this podcast, and I hope you enjoy my playthrough of Ocarina of Time. I'm Paul Riley. Thanks for listening.